Right, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming. This is a full house, very well deserving of the occasion. I know some of you still um, are trying to get some lunch. Um, we'll be okay. We'll. Uh, yes, I will. I will. Uh, a couple of announcements before we uh, introduce our distinguished speaker today. Um, as you know me, I'm uh, been here for a long time. I'm Ali Amida, chair of political science. And this is our distinguished lecture of the year. This is something we do once a year. Um, uh, we as a faculty in the Department of Political Science, we help our students, the uh, Poli Sci Club, Peoples of um, Politics. We call them POP. They say like, you know, to uh, make it short. And uh, once a year, we bring a distinguished, um, eminent speaker to UNE. Um, for our students, but also for the university. And we have done it for many, many years. So this is really a big, big celebration, big event for all of us and our students and our guests from the community as well. I know that some people emailed me from the community and I'm glad they are coming to join us today. The, the other announcement I was told to uh, mention, I think Donna, ask me to remind students who are in the diversity leadership to wait for her in the back later on and sign a sheet that she needs them to, uh, uh, to, uh, to do for her own leadership diversity program. For some of you who have classes at one o'clock, feel free to leave. I know this is really important, but I'm so glad that you, uh, you took the, the, uh, uh, the time to come today. And um, we have done a lot of um, um, education um, and activities about uh, the event. So I'm, I'm really happy that we have um, uh, this wonderful crowd today. Also, I want to thank a few people who helped us organize this event. It took a lot of work. It's almost six months. And I think my wonderful assistant, Terry, uh, testified to that. We have gone through a lot of preparation, a lot of calling, a lot of organizing, uh, and uh, the students and the faculty were terrific in helping us make this event a reality. The, uh, the other thing also I want to mention, after the presentation by Dr. Talhami, we will have question and answers, and uh, I will ask um, some of you to line up and take the microphone and we'll take turns. David said that we'll pass it around and uh, I would like you to identify yourself and also ask your question and I'll try to be as egalitarian as possible so each section of the audience will be able to, to uh, participate and engage our speaker. Dr. Shibli Talhami is uh, Anwar Sadat is a professor of peace and development at the University of Maryland. He is probably one of, in my opinion, one of the most eminent scholars on the study of um, uh, the Middle East, and especially the very, very com complex topic of uh, the, uh, the United States and our own society in America, relationship with uh, the Middle East. Uh, in general, he has been active uh, as a scholar and also as, um, uh, as an educator and also very visible in the media. The, um, I'm not going to introduce him. I just wanted to um, give this brief introduction to all of you. And it only, I think, it will be uh, appropriate to ask our poli Size Students Club to stand up. And also, I would like Professor James Roach also to stand up so people recognize them. I know he's eating his sandwich, but I think it's time to um, <laughs> So this is uh, Professor James Roach, who is the advisor for our poli Students Club. And our uh, officers are where is Britt and Mike. Mike maybe will not be able to, oh, there he is. And Britt is here. And the, the president of the Students Club is Ioana Panathio, uh, our wonderful junior, uh, who is going to uh, come here and introduce uh, our speaker, Dr. Um, Shibli Talhami. So uh, without further ado, um, um, thank you again. And um, Iwana will come here to introduce our speaker.
Um, I would like to thank all of you for coming here today, and of course, Dr. Telhami for accepting our invitation. Our guest speaker today is the Anwar Sadat Professor for Peace and Development at the University of Maryland College Park and non-resident senior fellow at the Saban Center at Brookings Institution. He received a Bachelor of Arts in Mathematics, a Master's in Philosophy and Religion, and a PhD in Political Science from UC Berkeley. Before coming to the University of Maryland, he has taught at universities such as Ohio State, Swarthmore, University of Southern California, UC Berkeley, Princeton, and Columbia. Professor Talhami was given the Distinguished International Service Award by the University of Maryland in 2002 and the Excellence in Public Service Award by the University System of Maryland Board of Regents in 2006. This being said, Professor Talhami is best known for his active role in foreign policy. He has served as an advisor to the U.S. mission in the U.N. back in the 90s, and more recently as a senior advisor to George Mitchell, President Obama's U.S. Special Envoy for the Middle East Peace, and as a member of the U.S. delegation to the Trilateral U.S.-Israeli-Palestinian Anti-Incitement Committee. He has also served on the board of the U.S. Institute of Peace and on the board of Human Rights Watch. Currently, he is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and in this capacity has co-drafted reports on U.S. public diplomacy, on the Arab-Israeli peace process, and on the Persian Gulf security. His best-selling book, The Stakes, America and the Middle East, was selected by Foreign Affairs as one of the top five books on the Middle East in 2003. His other publications include Power and Leadership and International Bargaining, The Path to the Camp David Accords, Identity and Foreign Policy in the Middle East, and most recently, The Peace Puzzle, America's Quest for Arab-Israeli Peace, and The World Through Arab Eyes, Arab Public Opinion, and the Reshaping of the Middle East. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Shibli Talhami. Thanks very much. It's really a pleasure for me to be here, and I, what a setting you have here. It's a fantastic place. I, I knew that it would be a beautiful part of the country, but I've never imagined how beautiful it is out here. I can't, I can't wait to be here in the summer to see what it's like. Um, I understand that uh, uh, the snow on the ground is an exception to the rule, that uh, it's usually as sunny as it is today, and you had a, happened to have a passing storm this time around. Um, uh, I, I uh, really uh, uh, I'm very very happy also to meet some of the students. I had uh, the pleasure of having uh, breakfast with some of them. Really impressive, uh, smart young people. And of course, I already know that you have high quality faculty. Uh, Professor Ahmeda is is a very prominent scholar who could be anywhere, and it's very impressive that you attract someone of that sort. And and Dean uh, Jean Hay, who happened to be also a former student of mine at Ohio State. Uh, I have interacted with her at three institutions right now, Ohio State, Miami, and, and here. So um, it's really a, a, a great pleasure for me to be here. Uh, let me start by um, just uh, setting up my talk uh, related to the book. Um, I, I have to, I know that many of you uh, have been like many other people around the world, mesmerized by the Arab uprisings, and particularly the pictures that emerged in Egypt in Tahrir Square that overthrew a, a dictator uh, after so many years. And it, it really was an inspiring uh, view that a lot of people had. And by the way, is now captured by this movie, The Square, that had been nominated uh, to the Oscar as Best Documentary. And if you haven't seen it, uh, go ahead and see it, because it's actually available for free on Netflix, for those of you who, who can subscribe uh, to, to Netflix. And, and so with the, with the start of the Arab uprisings in, in 2010, 2011, you know, very few people now doubt the fact that people matter, that, our, that public opinion matters in the Middle East, and now it's part of, uh, you know, the ongoing assumption. But that wasn't always the case. And I have to go back to tell you, first of all, about my interest in understanding what Arab people really think and what they want in the world, what their fears are, what their aspirations are, why it's important to study it, even long before these Arab uprisings, when we had mostly authoritarian rulers governing every country in the Arab world. It goes back to a first book, my first book was on the Camp David negotiations between Israel and Egypt back in the 70s that led to a historic agreement, the Camp David Accords, after many decades of enmity and war between the two countries. And when I was doing my uh, research for that book, 
Um, I was struck by some of what was happening actually at that uh, critical meeting at Camp David, Maryland, when then President Jimmy Carter brought then uh, President of Egypt, Anwar Sadat, and Prime Minister of Israel, Menachem Begin, uh, to Camp David to force them to have an agreement, uh, almost with no limit on time. He said, you're not leaving here without having an agreement. And he sat there that first day. He brought them together into a meeting. They came together, the three of them, and they were basically starting with their bargaining positions, putting extremist positions on the table. And when uh, Menachem Begin spoke, the Prime Minister of Israel, he demanded that the President of Egypt make certain concessions, tough concessions. And the President of Egypt turned to him and said, if, you, if I accept what you ask me to accept, my people wouldn't let me, my people wouldn't even have me, uh, my people wouldn't support me. And so the Prime Minister of Israel turned to him and said, Mr. President, what are you talking about? You're essentially a dictator. He didn't quite call him a dictator, but it was pretty close. You, you control the public, you tell them what they want to believe, they believe you. In any case, you don't have to pay attention to them. Well, it's kind of interesting to think about that. That was a mindset. That was mo not just a mindset of the Prime Minister of Israel. That was the mindset of many scholars and most certainly many analysts. In fact, just a few weeks ago, the CIA released the documents from that period of CIA memos and assessments pertaining to Egypt and Israel connected with the Camp David Accords. I happen to have gone through them and actually I did a segment for National Public Radio on them because some of them were particularly interesting. But here was a document coming out of Egypt. Uh, a CIA analyst is making an assessment at the request of the government of whether or not Anwar Sadat is going to have support among the Egyptian people for his initiative to, to break uh, years of enmity to make peace with Israel. And uh, so the CIA document went like this, and I, I, I you know, remember it quite distinctly. Uh, it said, in Egypt there are roughly 35 million people at the time. Now it's over 80 million, by the way. Um, and uh, Sadat has the support of the military, he has the support of the bureaucracies. Now here comes the people. Uh, then they enumerate people in Upper Egypt, people in the Delta, of uh, Nile Delta, people in the slums of the cities, and you, they enumerate roughly 32 million people in these places, out of 35 million. And they say, editorially, they don't matter. They said, they, they don't count. Uh, you know, they, they, don't, they don't have, so basically don't, we don't need to know what they think. That was really very common across the board. You don't have to know because they're dictators. Well, the truth of the matter is, all Arab rulers for that entire period, up until the uprising, behaved as though their public opinion matters, even though they can overcome them. They were worried about it, and they did a lot of things about it. And even in that period, when you look at Anwar Sadat, Yes, up to a point it's true that the farmer in Upper Egypt didn't really have a way of influencing Sadat directly. But guess what happened? Sadat signed a peace treaty and he didn't accept all the concessions that Begin was asking him to do. He was assassinated. Not only was he assassinated, but that period was the birth of Islamist militancy that gave rise to Ayman Zawahiri, who is now the head of Al-Qaeda. Now you can say the public don't matter. That is a very simplistic way to look at the world uh, because you're thinking that, oh, they don't have connection to, directly to the ruler. But publics matter. Every ruler has behaved as though publics matter, even long before the Arab uprisings emerged. One other example from that period, uh, from, well, from a decade later than that, in, in 1990. Uh, you know, in 1990, when Iraq invaded Kuwait, the King of Jordan, then King Hussein, was one of America's closest allies. Not only was he one of America's closest allies, but he was highly dependent on the U.S. He was highly dependent politically, economically, uh, for U.S. support. If you had to ask, 
who among Arab rulers is most dependent on the U.S., you would have to say King Hussein of Jordan. Iraq invades Kuwait, and the U.S. creates an international coalition, even gets U.N. support for a war against Iraq to dislodge Iraq out of Kuwait. Many Arab governments supported, particularly Gulf states, who were also helping the king economically. And the king said no to his biggest bankers and biggest political allies. Why would he do that? Why would he do that? He lost support afterwards. He did it for one simple reason. Because his public opinion was so adamantly opposed to the war that he thought he would lose his legitimacy and uh, possibly his crown. And for that reason, he was prepared to lose the support and backing of economic support, even though this was no democratic country. So I thought from that beginning, from, from those years, that we really don't understand our public opinion and how it's important. We need to document it. We need to understand it uh, even before the openings occurred in the Arab world. And as after that Iraq uh, uh, war of 1991, um, I started doing some research on public opinion. I wrote uh, two articles immediately about public opinion uh, in, 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 in 1992, 1993, and how it matters in Arab politics. But we really had no way of knowing. Well, most of our idea about public opinion was based on interviews, visits, uh, but we had no idea how pervasive these opinions were, whether they were capturing public opinion. And just as we were doing this research in the middle of 1990s, something big happened in the Arab world. And that is the emergence of satellite television, which revolutionized the media environment completely. It created something different for the following reason, that governments themselves could no longer control the narrative within their own boundaries. And to give you just a flavor of that over the decade, when I started doing uh, polling in the, in the late 1990s, um, when you asked Arabs, where do you get your information, most people would identify a television station within their own boundaries. By 2010, the year of the beginning of the Arab uprising, when you asked Arabs, where do you get your news, most Arabs said, from a television station outside their own boundaries. And that gives you a flavor and picture of how much was taking place. So when that started, I thought to myself, this is big. This information revolution is going to have an impact. It's going to have an impact not only on opinion, because obviously governments are no longer going to control the narrative, but even more possibly on how people identify themselves, who they are. Are they Egyptian? Are they Syrian? Are they Arab? Are they Muslim? Are they citizens of the world? What are they? Because the nature of the media and the audiences of the media and the message of the media is going to have an impact on how they define themselves. And we need to have an understanding, an empirical understanding of what is actually taking place. So I designed a 10-year poll uh, from the beginning, trying to understand, number one, where do people get their information? What are they watching for news? Are they, are they getting it from the internet, from TV, from radio, from newspapers? Which ones? How many hours are they spending on those things? And so study the evolution of the media. And second, how is their identity changing? And then documenting those changes over time, from year to year. And third, how are their opinions affected by these changes on major issues? major issues such as foreign policy, like attitudes toward the US or the Arab-Israeli conflict or the Iraq war, uh, or social issues, the role of women, uh, the role of religious, uh, relig the, the religious leaders, uh, democracy, freedom. Um, all of those issues we needed to document to try to understand and then have a scientific uh, analysis of the relationship between the media and identity and opinion over time. So the product was this book, The World Through Arab Eyes, uh, which, is, uh, which covers many different things. And I'm obviously not going to talk today about every single thing. I'll just give you a flavor of what it covers. And then I'm going to only limit my formal talk to three issues that I want to talk about directly before I open it up for questions. Now, 
the book as it stands, uh, not surprisingly, starts with this big idea about what I call Arab identities. I'm gonna, that's one of the issues, one of the themes I want to talk about today. How Arab identities have been changing over the past decade. It goes into uh, trying to understand uh, themes, questions like the Arab-Israeli conflict, the Iraq war, a foreign policy. So there's the policy toward Iran, Arab attitudes toward Iran, Arab attitudes toward the rest of the world. Uh, there's also a chapter uh, on um, how Arabs view uh, uh, democracy and the role of women and the role of religion. Uh, there is a chapter actually that is focused specifically on the Arab-Israeli conflict which I call the prism of pain through which Arabs view the world. Uh, there is also a chapter on how Americans view the Arab world. Because simultaneous with my polling in the Arab world, I carried out two other sets of polls. One was in the US to see how American views of the Arab world are changing, particularly from 9-11 through the Arab uprisings. Uh, and also in Israel itself to see how Israeli views are different or similar to Arab views, particularly on the Arab-Israeli issue. And so there is uh, also analysis of that in the book. Obviously, I'm not going to cover all these issues. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about three themes, and they're in some ways related. The first theme is Arab identities and why that's important to understand. The second theme is the role of foreign policy, why I think a lot of our analysts misunderstand how central foreign policy is in the Arab uprisings. And the third is, uh, so what is enduring, what is this Arab uprising? What, what is it about and, and, and how is it likely to unfold? So to, to give you a little interpretation of the meaning of the Arab uprising. So let me start with the identity question. Now, to be frank, identity is absolutely central to my analysis. Why is it central to my analysis? Many of you might be interested in public opinion in general, whether it's American public opinion or any, anybody else's public opinion. But frankly, we all know public opinion changes. It's fluid. So it, if you look at public opinion, it gives you a snapshot of people's views on issues at any given time. So in and of itself, it's interesting, sometimes even important at any given time, but it is not necessarily in and of itself indicative of what people aspire or, uh, to be or, or what their fears are. However, I think for me, trying to understand public opinion is a way of understanding not so much what people think today, but the prism through which people look at the world. The framework that people employ when they give a public opinion poll their fears and aspirations that drive their opinion. So what I'm trying to do in this is not just understand they say this today and they say this tomorrow. I want to understand why they say this today and why they say this tomorrow and predict it and figure out what it means. And I'm going to give you examples of this that really come out of that research, how change can tell you something about who they really are. And you really can't understand that prism or framework that people employ unless you understand how they define themselves and who they are. And so identity is central because we have done, I'm not the only one who's done research on identity and, uh, and viewership. We know that who you are often defines what you watch on television, not the other way around. And the Fox News watchers are predefined group, they go to Fox News because it agrees with them, not the other way around. MSNBC viewers are sort of the same thing. It, I'm, I'm not sort of, obviously media matters, and I, I have a whole theory about what areas it matters in, but, but, but you don't understand that process unless you understand how people define themselves in the first place. So, so what has happened over the decade prior to the Arab uprisings and since the Arab uprisings in the Middle East pertaining to identity. One of the questions that I ask is, uh, assuming that you're all of many things, you're at the same time Arab and Egyptian or Jordanian, uh, Muslim or Christian, you're all these things and a citizen of the world, and many of us are complex and we are all these things at once. Everybody has a com complicated identity in some form or another. But which one is more important to you today? 
And so we tried to measure how people prioritize their identity over time. And so what we've seen in that decade is interesting. That there was a decline of identification with the state. People were less inclined to say they're Egyptian or Jordanian or Saudi first. And there was an increase in Islamic identification. They're more inclined to say they're Muslim first. And Arab remained relatively steady for the same decade with not much change uh, across the board. Now, I have to uh, alert you to the fact, first of all, that the Arab world is diverse. It's not that each country doesn't differ from another on some important issues, including identity. In fact, there are major differences. It is at the aggregate level, and even country by country, this shift had occurred across the board when you look at the data for the decade. But country by country, people have different emphases. Lebanese, for example, it doesn't matter whether they're Sunni or Shia, Christian or Muslim, or Druze, they say they're Lebanese first. The majority of Lebanese always say they're Lebanese first. More than Muslim or Christian or Shia or Sunni, by far. Across the board, every single segment. Saudis, the overwhelming majority say they're Muslim, and very few people say they're Saudi. Uh, less than 20% of the population. In Egypt, they're divided almost equally of, uh, among those who say they're Egyptian first, Muslim first, or or uh, Arab first. Uh, so you have the most balanced kind of uh, division. So there are differences across the board, but aggregately there was this shift of less identification with the state, more identification with Islam. The question is why, I think it's very important to understand it, because it informs us a little bit about something that a lot of analysts have misunderstood. Because a lot of analysts said, this is indication of the fact that political Islam is on the rise, meaning those people who want Islam to dominate politics is on the rise. And that is wrong. And that is not what the data shows. In fact, the data shows quite the opposite of that. And now, let me tell you why I, I, I make this assessment. First, uh, differentiate between religion and, and political religion. Uh, so when you ask people in the Arab world, are you religious, you have overwhelming numbers say yes. In Egypt, uh, over 90%, almost in some polls like Gallup or Pew, they're like 99% said they're, they, 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 religion is meaningful to them in some way, whether they're Christian or Muslim. You know, as you know, Egypt has 10% of the population Christian. And uh, invariably, they say religion is important to them. But that's absolutely different from saying that religion is they want religion to dominate the state, or they embrace political Islam as a mode of governance. Completely different. And we find that, uh, you know, the, there was this uh, uh, major intellectual uh, uh, Egyptian um, thinker, uh, Muhammad Hassanin Haikal. He's one of, uh, you know, he's been around for ages. He's almost 90. I don't know how old is he now. About over 90 years old, maybe. And still writes and very, very thoughtful. And he said, you know, Egypt is a civil secular nation that loves religion. And then that's kind of an interesting formulation. It's a civil secular nation that loves religion. Okay, so don't, don't get the love of religion to mean an embrace of a political order. It's not identical. And for what we find actually in the data, and it's kind of interesting, is that much of the decline of affiliate with the state, of people saying, you know, fewer people saying I'm Egyptian first or Jordanian first, is a function of the failure of the state, you know, first of all. So the alternatives failed, so they, they bounce, you know, some of the benefit goes to, to something else. And we know they failed. That's not, you know, a surprise. We've seen, we've been doing the polling for more than a decade to show that people are not happy with their governments. That, that has been steady. And even more so in these countries where you know, if, if, you, if you look at uh, Professor Ahmeda here from, uh, you know, coming out of a, 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 a country of Libya, I mean, if you were Libyan growing up in that era, uh, and, and, you know, and, and if, you, if you imagine that what is Libya, it's very hard to separate Libya from the ruler because Gaddafi was in power from 1969. You know, so if you, the overwhelming majority of Libyans were born 
while he was president, the overwhelming majority of people, I don't even know, probably 80% of Libyans by the time he died, had been born while he was president. And so when you think of Libya, you're thinking of Gaddafi. If you don't like Gaddafi, you, you, you're very hard, it's very hard for you to embrace, to embrace Libya. I mean, so, so there's a harder, difficult to separate the two in your own minds. That's another reason why there's decline. The rise of Islam is not only because Islamist groups have shown that they were able to challenge the order more. That was certainly true. But there was something else that we always don't understand in identity selection. And that is that very often we select that aspect of our identity that is most under threat. You are what you have to defend. And when one aspect of identity is under assault, you rally behind it. And if you look at that whole decade prior to the Arab uprisings, what you find is there was a pervasive sense in the Arab world that Islam was under assault, that the post 9-11 order was a clash of civilization war coming out of, led by the US to weaken the Muslim world. We find that across the board in our, in our uh, 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 polling. And so that sense of, you know, rallying behind, it was a particular interpretation of their state of affair uh, in, in relation with the outside world. So identity changed, it's critical, and that change itself, I think, can inform us about how people are making their choices. Now, to, to, to give you more concrete examples of that, I want to move to the second point, uh, which is uh, that foreign policy is central in the way they define their priority, people, Arabs define their priorities, even in these uprisings. Now, I say that because, you know, we have this interpretation that uh, took hold in our discourse, particularly after uh, Tahrir Square in Egypt, where people saying, we want freedom, we want democracy, and foreign policy wasn't part of the slogans. It was, by the way, but it was not visible as visible as normal in, in foreign policy. I happened to be there just a week after. I was in one of these million-person demonstration to Harir Square a week after Mubarak was overthrown. And, uh, and you know, there were many signs about related to foreign policy that I could see, and some of which I, I filmed. But nonetheless, that wasn't... The, the driving force. People wanted freedom. They wanted to get rid of their, their regimes. But what I want to argue to you is, while that's true, people were seeking freedom and democracy and they wanted to get rid of authoritarianism, that you couldn't separate this pursuit of dignity that they talked about in every country, that it was about karama. Uh, the, 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 the Egyptians said after the overthrow of Mubarak, erfa rasak fo inta masri raise your head high, you're an Egyptian. Or the Libyans said uh, the same thing, raise your head high, you're, you're Libyan. It was all about dignity. It was all about restoring dignity. But the dignity that they sought wasn't just in the relationship between them and the rulers, but in the relationship between their countries and the outside world. And their anger was with rulers was, of course, in part because the rulers didn't provide to them education, jobs, freedom, but also because the rulers failed to raise their head in the world. And you can't understand, you can't decouple those two. Those two are related. And let me give you examples why I think it's related, and I think our discourse didn't understand it very well. Let me start with the issue of identity. I already told you that, um, you know, uh, most people in the Arab world, when you ask, are you Arab first, are you Muslim first, are you Egyptian or, or Jordanian first? Most of them identify either Arab or Muslim first, or Muslim or Arab first. So those who identify themselves with the state are less than half. So what does that mean? Well, when, you're, when you think of yourself as being an Arab, then you, you're looking at other Arabs and what matters to them. So if you're an Egyptian, you care about Libyans. If you're Libyan, you care about Palestinians. Uh, uh, the same thing about Muslim identity. So you already care about people outside your own boundaries. But even more so, we have a question in the poll that drives the point home. We ask people, do you believe that the role of government is 
to serve the interests of its citizens or to serve the interests of Muslims broadly or Arabs broadly. And we have more than half, say, the Muslims of either, the, the interests of either Muslims or Arabs broadly. When you think that your government has to serve the interest of Muslims and Arabs even more than the citizens, then you understand that they expect the government to play a role on everything that has to do with other Arabs and Muslims outside their boundaries. What does that mean? That means foreign policy is center stage. In fact, I will go further than that. Uh, if you look at the decade that preceded the Arab uprisings, uh, what do you see? People say this, is, this revolt was about economy. People wanted jobs or it's about freedom. As I said, those were, of course, important. But you know, if I, I challenge anyone to go back to that decade and tell me that there was a major economic crisis the likes of which the region had not seen in previous decades. There was nothing particularly unique that would lead to what we witnessed uh, in 2010. In fact, nobody, including those people who said the economy and jobs, had predicted what actually happened. There was nothing unique about it. Yes, it's a driving force, but it's not something that would lead you to predict the outcome uh, that was new and different from previous outcomes. So if you look at that decade, actually the most distinctive part of the decade that, that generated the most public mobilization over the entire decade was foreign policy. It began. And in fact, the, the, the whole success of the new media, the new satellite television in the 1990s, was a function of galvanizing events on foreign policy that propelled, that grabbed the attention of the Arab publics to the satellites that were covering these foreign policy issues, starting with 2000, after the collapse of Israeli-Palestinian negotiations and the start of the second Intifada Palestinian uprising it led to a lot of bloodshed between Israelis and Palestinians, galvanized public opinion. 9-11, that was such a tragedy for us, but had consequences for them. Uh, and then, of course, the Iraq war that was so unpopular in 2003. Overwhelming majority, over 90 percent of Arabs said they opposed the Iraq war, and yet they found the rulers acquiescing in that war, in some cases supporting the U.S. on that war uh, at a period when uh, they were clearly opposing, uh, and uh, the, so the anger with the with the rulers was was uh, you know uh, multiplied by virtue of their rulers doing things that went against their sense of interest and identity. And then you had the 2006 Lebanon war, and uh, between Israel and Hamas, and the 2008 war between Israel, at, 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 I mean the 2006 between Israel and, and Hezbollah in Lebanon and then 2008, 2009 between Israel and Hamas. Those were the galvanizing events that generated the most public reaction over the decade. Here's the third uh, uh, a, uh, evidence that I want to muster in about that importance. One of the questions that I ask uh, in my poll is whom among world leaders do you admire most outside your own countries? I don't want to put them in a position to say they don't like their king or their president. Uh, these, you know, so I, you know, say outside your own country. And so I want to give you a flavor of the people that uh, they, they identified over their decade. And then remember what I told you, the poll is not about the information that you're going to get at that snapshot, but understanding the framework they're employing when they're making that selection. Think about that for a minute and think about what that might tell you. So I start with 2003. This is the time when we go to war with Iraq. In 2004, right after the war with Iraq. Now, if you look at our discourse, I invite you to look back, and you'll see this is the time when the thesis about the clash of civilization was big. This is the time when they hate us for our freedom, they hate us for our democracy kind of paradigm, right? And and that's part of the justification for the Iraq war. Uh, and. Uh, and in the Arab world, there were people who were embracing that, like Al-Qaeda and its supporters, the militants, who obviously want a clash of civilization. So you had, a, you had people on both sides making that argument. So here I'm asking, right in the middle of this intense confrontation in the Arab world, I, I do polling in six countries, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Morocco, Jordan, Lebanon, the United Arab Emirates. Uh, name the leader that you admire most in the world. 
and you're expecting a some Islamist leader, maybe not militant, perhaps moderate. And they and I this is an open question. I don't give them a name. I don't give them any list. They come they have to come up with their own name. Open. They have to write the name down. Jacques Chirac of France, the former president of France. Now you say, wait a second now, this is crazy because you know, of course, not only is France a Western country, it's a Western country with imperial you know, history in the Arab world. And at that time, they were also having these controversial policies on women's veils in French schools and policies toward immigrants from North Africa. How could this be that they're embracing this guy, Jacques Chirac, as their most admired leader in the world? Well, before I answer the question, uh, I'll give you a second hint, which is 2006, 2007. Now, this is a time when the, the discourse has shifted. It's no longer about a clash of civilization. What are people talking about? They're talking about, quote, the Sunni-Shia divide. Why are they talking about sectarian divide? Because that's what happened in Iraq after the Iraq war. We have the Sunnis and the Shia war. So people are expecting that this is now what people think, you know, the Sunnis and, and, and uh, uh, Shia. Well, most countries where I poll are Sunni, overwhelmingly Sunni. Uh, including particularly Egypt, Morocco, Saudi Arabia. Well, in 2006, 2007, the number one most popular man was the Shia leader of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah. Just think about that for a minute. And then fast forward a couple more years, 2008, 2009, uh, the most popular leader is Hugo Chavez of Venezuela. And then you have to ask the question, okay, so what is in common in this whole decade? What, what do the people have in mind? Why, why are these people, why are people selecting them? Well, Jacques Chirac was very clear. In 2003, uh, in 2004, he did two things that propelled him in Arab public opinion. He, was, he said no to George W. Bush at the UN on the Iraq war, and he invited the late Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat uh, as a head of state when he died in Paris after being isolated by the U.S. and Israel in his compound in, in Ramallah. They, they forgave him everything else because that was the prism, the prism of standing up to Israel and to the U.S. Hassan Nasrallah, well, why would they embrace a Shia leader of a, uh, a group in Lebanon? He fought against Israel in 2006 in what was seen to be the only, quote, dignified and effective war against Israel. They were waiting for it. Hugo Chavez, after the Israeli war with Hamas in 2008-2009, he was the only leader in the world to cut off diplomatic relations with Israel over this issue. So if you look at this decade, in terms of heroes and villains, I have a lot of stories about the villains as well. Uh, they're all related to foreign policy. They were not embracing Democrats. And here's an interesting final point I want to make related to that. Um, in 2011, one year after the beginning of the Arab uprisings in my poll in Saudi Arabia and Jordan, uh, I asked the same question. Whom among world leaders do you admire most? And remember, this is seen as now embracing people who are democratic. And they were. Erdogan of, of Turkey was uh, high up in many co countries, particularly Egypt at that time. Uh, well, in Saudi Arabia and Jordan, the number one answer was Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein, long after he had been dead, in large part because of his sense of the outcome of that war, still focused on the outcome of that war. But I want to end with the Turkey example. Um, in 2000. 11, 2012, uh, the Prime Minister of Turkey was very popular in the Arab world. It's changed since a little bit. And a lot of people said this is because he is a, an example of an Islamic Democrat. And that's really what they're looking for. They want, they want somebody who's an Islamic but who's got some democracy and they like Turkey, and they did. Well, that is really something that doesn't capture the whole story of that decade. And I want to give you just examples why that's not the case. Uh, the Prime Minister of Turkey had been a leader in Turkey for much of that past decade. 
they didn't select him in any of the previous years except after the Gaza war when he was said to have stood up to Israel on the flotilla issue. That's when they selected him. When he was seen to be raising his head in the world from their point of view, from who they are, not before that. Had Turkey, even if it had been a democratic, a democratic the Islamic country and seen that way, had he been seen to be a, an apologist of Israelis or an ally of the Israelis, uh, there's no way they would have selected him. Because they want, yes, they want somebody who brings in that combination, but it's not enough for them because that issue matters to them. And the third issue is prosperity. Had Turkey been poor, they don't select Bangladesh and they don't select Pakistan, Turkey was seen to be prosperous. So they want all these things. Yes, they want freedom, mixture of freedom of their own democ and their own culture. Uh, they want to raise their heads high in the world and, and they want, yes, economic benefits. All these things come together and they're very hard to split. Let me end with just uh, one point related to what we, it is that we're witnessing. A lot of people say uh, that this is an episodic set of uprisings and they, they're only going to go back, look at what's happening, the reactions in Egypt and elsewhere. I disagree with that. I think what we're seeing in the Arab world is profoundly new and important. And it's a transformation that is likely to stay with us. Uh, and what is that then? You ask, so what is it that's unique about these set of uprisings? Uh, I believe that it is the empowerment of the individual in the Arab world uh, at, at a level that we had not seen before and in a way that cannot go back because it is enabled by an information revolution that is only expanding. Uh, and therefore, people will want their voices heard in unprecedented ways. And I compare it uh, in some ways uh, to the Industrial Revolution in the West. The impact of the Industrial Revolution it was very different and for different reasons. The earning of wages helped, led to the empowerment of the individual that led to demands of rights in society and, and, and in politics. Uh, the information revolution is having something very comparable for different reasons and it's just hard to put back. It is going to only expand, and anybody who thinks they can roll history back doesn't understand these dynamics. But here's the bad news. Uh, the bad news is that empowered public doesn't mean unanimous public or that the public really knows what it wants, particularly as it opens up. So when you get an empowered public, you're going to get the religious groups and the secular groups. You're going to get the Shia and the Sunni, the Christian and the Muslim the rich and the poor. Uh, uh, you're going to get every segment of the public vying against each other. So you have more competition and confrontation in the short term. And the more diverse a society is, the more diverse a country is, the more complicated it gets. And the second reason why it gets more complicated is public empowerment never determines the outcome of politics, not even in democracy, not even in our mature democracies. It is only a factor in a very complex game of politics that we all study. And so a, even when a public is unified, it's still vying against institutions, bureaucracies, <coughs> multinational corporations, militaries, all of which have invested interests that they will defend. So it changes the name of the game. It means that nobody can ignore the voice of the people, but it doesn't tell you a, how long the struggle will be sustained, or what the outcome will be, and only contextual analysis can inform you about it country by country. But have no mistake, have no mistake. The driving force here is a people aspiration for dignity and freedom. They want to have a chance to raise their head high in the world. Thank you very much. I would like to thank Dr. Talhami for very inspiring and very, very um, uh, interesting way of looking at something that we often 
uh, really don't think about that. There is a, a civil society, there is a public opinion, and there is a tremendous diversity, maybe not as big as America, but also have maybe 22 states that have very, very diverse structure, aspiration, and public opinion. Also, um, I think it was very interesting to uh, recognize the, the fact that identity is, is complex, the identity is negotiated, identity is changing and not static and more one-dimensional. And the, uh, the certain issues like religion and state-society relations and the Palestinian question is very, very central, despite the fact it's being denied often our prism of thinking about it. And finally, that um, uh, when we recognize there is a public opinion and there is also civil society that exists as not just Orientals and um, people who are faceless, uh, then that really brings humanity and brings um, uh, history in to our thinking about uh, what goes on in that very diverse and complex region. And for good and bad, we are connected to them as they are connected to us, which is, I think, another theme that keep, keep, keep coming in, in the presentation. Okay, uh, now the floor is open for questions and comments. And um, Tom raised his hand, so he will... Uh, David, would you give him the... Uh, the microphone, thank you. And thank you. I know some of you would like to uh, you have classes. Feel free to sneak out. Uh, we'll miss you. The, but uh, the lecture and the talk will be uh, recorded. And you will be able to um, view it and uh, catch up with what you are missing in today's talk. Tom. Thank you, uh, Professor Telhami, for a wonderful lecture. Help us to reconcile the major theme of your talk about the drive for political freedoms, for empowerment of the individual, for dignity, with the issues of women's rights and women's freedoms mm -hmm. and dignity. Um, Tahrir Square in Cairo, um, crowds desiring we want freedom, um, yet rec you know, how do you reconcile that with the repeated tax on women by uh, gangs of men? Lara Logan from 60 Minutes, one prominent example of sure. something that's happened many times over. So help us understand those, those connections. Thank you. Sure. Um, uh, first of all, you know, when you look at um, you know, what I talked about in terms of um, the empowerment of people from right to left, uh, that's what public empowerment is. And what we've seen in Egypt, for example, is a lot of ultra-conservatives who had been dormant uh, as a political force who actually surfaced. Uh, uh, that include the so-called Salafis, not necessarily violent, some of them actually rather peaceful, uh, but nonetheless have ultra-conservative views, particularly on gender issues. They had not even been factor in politics in Egypt at the time, uh, during the Mubarak era. And suddenly they surfaced, just like you have the liberals, uh, uh, even though the liberals, particularly including young women, led much of the early uprisings, uh, actually then they were facing all these other contending forces. It speaks to that idea that I have about uh, empowerment of the public doesn't mean the public is unified, and obviously you're going to have these forces in society. But I think we, we don't look at the woman issue properly. I have a whole um, you know, section in the book on this issue. Um, one of the things that I ask, um, when you ask people, are you pro-women's right, of course, everybody says yes. I mean, uh, the Islamic Revolution in Iran says they're pro-women because, you know, the the unveiled women are just your marketing quote and they have all kinds of rationalization right everybody comes up with their own rationalization for why they think they're more pro-women it's just they frame it that way so it's not meaningful to ask that question therefore so what we did in 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 my poll is focus on a very practical question which has consequences how they think about it do you believe that women have the right to work outside the home always, when economically needed, or never. Now that is a comfort zone, right? Because that's consequential now. It's not just about this theory. It's, will they let their wives or their daughters go out to the house to work, right? That's, that's the question. And um, what we found surprisingly across the board, including in Saudi Arabia, is that um, those who say never are, are really a minority, in, in most cases less than 25% across the region. We, we find a good chunk of people who say always, but the plurality says when economically needed. Now that's significant because here's what I want to say about that. 
Um, I know we tend to think that women's rights are connected to, uh, to culture uh, and religion. And yes, these are factors, undoubtedly. But if you look at the history of women's rights, particularly in places where they didn't have them and they acquired them, it was mostly a function of economic emancipation of women working, earning wages, and then demanding their rights. And this has happened in so many different traditional societies that we have a history of it. In fact, one of the most influential interpretations of why women are lacking rights in Muslim countries, particularly in, in the Middle East, is that it's really a, an outcome less of religion and culture and more of the political economy of oil that has not created enough incentive for the rise of women labor that then created that demand. And um, I am an adherent to that, meaning I, I believe that ultimately uh, for women to get their rights in the anywhere, but, it, but including in the Arab world, sure, I think constitutions matter, that you have to protect women's rights in the constitution, have to fight for it, because that's that you know, feature that you really have to fight for. Uh, but in society, the most important thing you can do is create incentives for women employment. Uh, and that's even more than education. And we see some of that happening already in ways that no government or even society can control. Let me just give you a story uh, of something I did while um, I was um, out in, in Saudi Arabia uh, as I was doing research for this book. Um, now, we talked about the information revolution, how it's empowering. Of course, it's empowering to men and women. One of the things about the beauty about information revolution is that, you know, uh, not only do you get information on your own, you can be in your bedroom, not, not out there, and connect the internet and get what you want, but also you have a sense of power because you are, uh, a lot of people actually responding to you. You may not you know, maybe your immediate family or your immediate society is not listening to you, but you tweet something interesting and, uh, and oh, you get thousands of people who agree with you, and suddenly you're like, could be even a celebrity, you know, in, 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 that, in the social media environment while you're not even leaving your room. And when we, um, when I went to a, a women's college in, in Saudi Arabia while I was there, by the way, in, in, the, in the Gulf states, interestingly, as the case in most of the Arab states, the, uh, there are more women than men in colleges now. More women than men in colleges. And in the Gulf states, remarkably, there are more women than men in science fields, uh, including physics and mathematics and some engineering. I mean, it's really remarkable. Where they're lagging behind is the employment issue. And so when I went to this college, I first of all, I, I, I talked to the director about sort of the sociology of the young women who are coming into, into the, this place. And she said, first, the first week, the first year we spend training them how to research, particularly on the internet. And by uh, the end of the year, they start uh, being active in, in the social media. And she says, quote, I monitor their tweets, she, she said. And, uh, and she said, the first thing they start asking is, why is the royal family getting away with this? And where is the, why does the budget not add up? And why did, you know, they're starting raising questions. I said, but what happens afterwards? She said, well, a lot of them actually, we train them to get good jobs and most of them get jobs. I said, but how does that work? Don't they have barriers in society of people saying, yeah, I want you to, to go home, yeah, get your degree, go home. She said to me something interesting. She said, young woman, who have a job now in Saudi Arabia at the middle class are, quote, more marriable. Okay, now, you know, it sounds sexist, of course it is, um, but, but it's important, right? Because it means that, that men are thinking that if a woman now has a job, she's, they're more, you know, they're more interested, not less interested. There used to be a threat to them. Now they're needed economically, and for that reason, they're actually find it attractive. That's the avenue for women's emancipation in the Arab world. And anybody who tells you it's all about religion, of course, they're conservatives. 
everywhere uh, in, in, in you know, ultra conservatives. Uh, and, and, and religion can be a barrier, and, and certainly law can be a barrier. But the, but the game is really about uh, the, the, the economics in society. We'll take um, maybe a question from the left side to be egalitarian, and then we'll come back to D Dean Hay. Chris. Hi, my name is Chris. Um, I, I was wondering, you mentioned that they tuned into foreign news. What news were they, in particular, were they tuning into the most? Yeah, when I say foreign news, I said actually, you know, meaning outside their own boundaries. They mostly go to Arab media. So what happened is that over, uh, between, 2000, uh, be between 2000 and 2010, uh, most of them were wait, watching the major new Arab satellite that are transnational, broadcast everywhere in Arabic, and principally Al Jazeera, and then Al Arabiya, which is was second, which is out of Saudi Arabia. Al Jazeera alone, uh, I had almost 50% in 2009, 2010, say that it's their first choice for news, and another 20 some percent say it's the second choice for news. So. Uh, the, so those were the dominant, the, the transnational Arab satellite media uh, were dominant. Uh, we've had an increase in the number of people who say the internet and their source of news only in the past five years. Only, this is unbelievably rapid. We've had an increase in the internet in the Middle East over the past five years of 30% a year. 30% increase a year, it's just exponential increase. And uh, we find that um, that is also having a, an early, there are early indications of it having an impact on notions of identity. So for example, people who say uh, their first source of news in the internet are more likely to say they are citizens of the world first, not, uh, not Arab or Muslim or, 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 or Egyptian. So it's kind of an interesting dynamic that has taken place. I'm so happy you're here, uh, Professor Telhami. Um, I remember having dinner at your house where you held a lecture uh, or a seminar one evening, and I also remember you having uh, much longer hair uh, when you were teaching. And, and no beard. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> anyway, um, it's such a delight to have you here. I have two uh, very distinct questions. The first is about Egypt specifically. So in your talk, you, you mentioned how issues of identity and foreign policy were prominent, and that the kind of Western understanding of political Islam, um, or the politicization of Islam has been wrongheaded. Um, so I wonder, just help us explain uh, the Arab Spring or the revolution, having begun you know, with an individual in Tunisia who was angry very specifically about local corruption, not about, at least as mm -hmm. I understand it, about issues of foreign <laughs> policy or, or even Islam. Mm -hmm. and, um, and also, how do we understand an organization that goes by the name Muslim Brotherhood, and maybe we misunderstand mm -hmm. it, if, uh, Islam, if the politicization of Islam is not Mm -hmm. that, that big an issue in the culture. My second and very different question is, you've been doing research in Morocco for many years. We opened a campus in Tangier uh, mm -hmm. two months ago, and I wonder if you would recommend to our students that they spend a semester there. Oh, well, <laughs> let, me start, let me start with the easy one, which okay. is, um, uh, I have, um, you know, I, I remember um, David Brooks of the New York Times, you know, he has this column every be beginning of the year about the school year. And one time he had a column about the recommendations of 10 people uh, educated in the country and called me and asked me to give my recommendation for his column. What is the one thing I would advise students to do before they leave college? And I said, leave the college. Um, and then I said, basically, go study, a semester study abroad is probably the single most important thing that they can do while college students. I am a big believer in that. It's huge. And now in the globalized world, it's very important that our students have a flavor of that. There's nothing you can learn in the classroom that will compensate for uh, an experience like that. And just to, to give you an example, my own daughter is a, um, a junior right now, and she is in Morocco studying abroad, just like, uh, so I, I obviously am recommending it to my own daughter. I recommend it to, to all your students. Um, the, the, just very quickly, of course, these are two big themes that you've, you've unleashed, but let me, 
Let me just give you um, very quick. The first one, uh, of course it was about dignity. Uh, and dignity is, you know, the, this Boazizi wasn't just about losing a job. It's about his inability in, in failure with the bureaucracy and being humiliated in the bureaucracy and not responding to him. And it was at the very same time that WikiLeaks were big about uh, Bin Ali and, and his abuses and, and everything else that was going on. Uh, for sure, that was a factor. But what I'm saying is their anger with the rulers, their pursuit of dignity for, from, their, from the rulers, is much more complicated than just being about jobs. I mean, it's about that for sure, but there was a lot more. They're angry for, with them for a lot of reasons, including the fact that they say that they don't see them as representing them with dignity in the world. And that's foreign policy. It's a combination of both, not one or the other. It's obviously both. Uh, on the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, political Islam is a fact of life in the Arab world. Nobody denies that. In Egypt, too, it has been. It's been always. And it is in, in Jordan. It's in Libya. It's everywhere. My own, uh, my own uh, view of it, and given on my public opinion polls, is that what you usually would have is anywhere between 25 to 30 percent support <laughs> for moderate political Islam across, uh, across the region. So that um, if there were, even now, with all the repression that has taken place, if you have uh, elections, parliamentary elections in Egypt, I still think the Muslim Brotherhood will probably get 25 to 30 percent of the seats. I still think that. So, so they are a force. But what the assumption was that they were the overwhelming majority. This was never the case. They won in Egypt in large part because the opposition was disorganized, in large part because the liberals rallied behind them. They didn't like the alternatives, particularly at the end. And you can see it in the Egyptian presidential elections. There were two rounds. The first round, there were really four leading candidates. The Muslim Brotherhood candidate, Mohammed Mursi, won only 26% of the vote. 26% of the vote. That's it. That's, all you, that, that's about their core. That's really their core. In the second round, uh, when, when he was running against one of Mubarak's men that the revolution was against, people were so divided that he barely won the election by just a little over half. And, and Mubarak's man almost got a half. And so it gives you an impression. And I had this debate with them. Uh, I, I, of course, you know, I was in Egypt uh, 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 just uh, a few weeks before Morsi was overthrown. Um, I went to, uh, to his office. I met with his uh, key uh, foreign policy advisor, um, Assam al-Haddad, who is now in prison like everybody else. And, um, and, I, and, and I said, you know, I, 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 was, I was saying to him, I think you're misinterpreting. You, you think that all the public is with you. Uh, you're not broadening enough. He said, what do you mean you're not broadening enough? I said, well, look, uh, you know, he said, we won, you know, we, we won. I said, you won, but you, even the presidential election, you had just a little over half of the population, half of the population didn't vote. In round one, it was even uh, more than that. Uh, he said, well, we, we, we won almost the, the Constitution by almost uh, two-thirds. It was 63 percent of the vote. I said, yes, but you only had one-third of the public vote in part because the, the rest of the public didn't even want to vote. And, uh, and I said, Cairo didn't even vote for it. And he said, Cairo? Cairo is not Egypt. I said, but Cairo is the heart of Egypt. You, can't, you might be able to win an election without Cairo, but you can't govern without Cairo. And by which I meant, of course, not Cairo, just the city, but the metaphor, uh, that all these people who are so important and essential in running a country that they're just ignoring by virtue of the fact they could win. They treated it as if it was a normal, mature, uh, mature win in, a, in a, an election. Um, uh, Rashid al ghanoushi who is the head of the Nahda party in Tunisia, the Islamist party, uh, which also won the election in Tunisia and is pursuing a completely different course of moderation in negotiating with, but he was just in, 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 uh, in uh, Washington last week. I went to dinner with him, and he said one thing that I stuck with me. Um, he said, in mature democracies, uh, it's enough to have 51% win. That's all you need, uh, and, and that's all you should need. But in transitions, that's not enough. You have to have a consensus. And they didn't, and they don't, 
and Egypt wouldn't be moving forward if the military doesn't learn that lesson itself, because they are now in a position where they themselves are thinking that they can do the same thing that the Muslim Brotherhood did, and they will fail. I think Nagib Mahfouz uh, will disagree and say Egypt is Cairo, and my students will, will agree with that as well. Uh, okay, um, other questions, folks. Okay, uh, Rachel, this is one of the students in the Mahfouz class, so I think she's another advocate here. Yes. Um, hello, my name is Rachel. I'm a business major and a student of Valia Ahmed Amida. Um, you mentioned well-known political leaders and rulers. Um, and my question to you is, do you think there are any other influential individuals, such as the Egyptian author and Nobel Prize winning Naguib Mahfouz, that may have influenced the people as far as religion or social change? Um, you know, um, Egypt is, 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 a, is a civilization. Uh, it's not even just a country. I mean, I think we, you know, I, I, um, I really urge you, I mean, especially since you're reading uh, Najib Mahfouz and, and uh, interested in international politics, if you have an opportunity, go there. Um, uh, and it, it's, it's just that when you're there, you have a sense of the immensity. Uh, and by I mean, say, the, the, the depth of uh, culture, the good and the bad, the beautiful and the ugly, the modern and the ancient, um, uh, all coming together in ways that transcend our ability to control it. Uh, and, and I used to go, you know, there were times when I'm, you know, I go to Egypt maybe three, four times a year for a variety of reasons, and I hear a member of Congress who had, doesn't even have a passport, never been outside the world, we're going to reform these people, or we're going to, you know, whatever. And, and, you know, I understand the intent, but it's just not understanding that complexity. So Nagib Mahfouz is one of the voices, one of the wonderful voices of a theme in Egyptian culture that is very strong, particularly among the elites, it still is. And he has his opponents, and he's had their opponents, because Egypt is complex. Egypt is many voices, and he's one of the prominent voices. The most important one, of course, in my book. Uh, okay, more questions. Oh, okay, Chris, you have another question? You want to mon monopolize the process here? Okay. Um, when I was working over the summer, I had a boss who was from Egypt. He was a Coptic Christian, and he was very concerned ba about the attacks on the Coptics in Egypt, and he was very concerned about sectarian strife, especially concerning his wife was still back in the country. Would you say that that is a real concern right now? Uh, yes, uh, it is. Uh, and it has been for the Christians um, in the Arab world really since the Iraq War. Um, and let me tell you why that becomes the case. Um, and, and we don't really understand it. We don't even understand sectarianism here. That if you have to ask me, so what are the two factors that fuel such sectarianism? It's not just Christian. Christian, because they're a minority that have deep roots in the Middle East, the, you know, they're, they're, and their numbers are declining. They feel it as minority because they have disadvantages. Minority that that's true in Iraq. The Iraqi Christians suffered quite a bit after the disintegration of the state in Syria, where they're now worried, and many of them are rallying behind Assad because they fear for, you know, um, militant Islamist opposition. So you have you have complexity in the reaction. But there are two things for me as a political scientist. I say, what is drive that, because these people coexist for many years. And Christians and Muslims have lived in harmony. Shia and Sunni have lived in harmony. So when do they you know, come at each other's throat? There are two things that go on. One is the disintegration of the state. Uh, when central authority is weakened, people start, you know, um, a, uh, uh, obviously a lot of voices become uh, out of control, but also everybody kind of relies on their immediate uh, sect or tribe or, or a group or organization, and that increases sectarianism. We see it in every place. So it, that's why I think one of the biggest mistakes everybody recognizes in Iraq, you know, the war itself was a mistake in my own opinion, but the, just the uh, breaking down the Iraqi army and the state institutions was the biggest mistake in Iraq. Uh, and that's why right now in Syria, uh, after going full speed to try to topple Assad, the Obama administration is, is applying the brakes because 
The CIA is telling the president that the own, that if you if you topple the regime and the Syrian army disintegrates, there's nothing that would stop militant Islamists from taking over. The Syrian army is the only one can do it. So they're changed their tactics. So state institutions are still central for the protection of minority rights, in my own opinion. You take that in. A second is what I ended with in my talk, which is the empowerment issue. So when you have empowered people, you're going to have the good and the ugly. I mean, they're both going to get empowered at the same time, and we see that in Egypt as well. You add to that sometimes tactics. I mean, uh, you know, uh, there are people who suspect that um, some of the interior ministry allowed people, allowed attacks on Christians to just make examples of them. Uh, that's a suspicion with a couple of in incidents that happened uh, before something that needed to be investigated. Uh, but it is unfortunate and it's understandable that uh, cops would be uh, worried. Um, as you know, they rallied behind the military uh, against the Muslim Brotherhood right now. Uh, you know, whether that's wise or not, in the short term, it's understandable. In the long term, does that make them also enemies? Um, it's something they have to worry about. So they're, they're in a bind. Uh, Brian, yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, Rick, I didn't recognize. Yeah, go ahead. Very quickly, uh, you've spoken about the Arab Spring in, in the uh, North Africa. How about the Arab Spring in, uh, in the Arabian Gulf? It seems to me that that came and went very, very mm -hmm. quickly. And it, it might be tied to your comment regarding economics. I don't know, mm -hmm. but it, it really strikes me that 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 one, uh, particularly in the Kingdom of Bahrain, seemed to be uh, um, yeah. squashed, and and that there's been no real good lesson learned. Right. Um, first of all, on Bahrain, just very quickly, I, I, without addressing it directly, um, uh, Bahrain is not just Bahrain. Bahrain is Saudi Arabia. So, and that that explains sort of you know what why the outcome was so overwhelming, both politically and militarily, economically. You know, that it's an extension of Saudi Arabia politically, and, and that's why you, you saw that kind of crushing. Uh, but in terms of can the Arab Spring reach the Gulf states in a, in a big way, I think yes. But here are two things that mitigate in the meanwhile. Uh, one is economics, because one of, one of the things that I talk about in my book about the, the role of economics were uh, they, have, they have obviously the richer, and they're able to co-op populations. And the uh, King of Saudi Arabia was very clever to immediately respond with huge billions, tens of billions of uh, programs to increase salaries, to employ, to uh, extend welfare, huge package to, to kind of uh, keep his, his public uh, in check. Uh, the second thing that, uh, and that, but they can't keep that for long, because I think it's more about freedom. But the second thing is, that right now there is a little bit of applying the brakes in the Arab world. Uh, in, in the same way that happened with the Iraq war, because people are terrified of anarchy. So they look at Libya, they don't, they're terrified with the uncertainty. They look at Syria and it's scary. They look at Egypt and it's unsettled. And so even in Jordan where you had a, a Muslim Brotherhood that was trying to you know, take on the king, uh, they're, they're, they're applying the brake because they think the public sentiment right now is wait and see attitude. So much so that um, this uh, Egyptian analyst that I cited who was very influential, Mohammed Hassan Haikal, who was a pan-Arabist, um, has written that he, he thinks that the Gulf states are actually actively trying to assure the failure of the Arab revolutions in Egypt and Syria and elsewhere in order to scare the public and say, see what you get if they happen. Uh, and I think it works up to a point, but it can't be sustained for the long time. Um, so I, I have a question sort of about the nature of studying public opinion. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I'm sure learning about public opinion at Berkeley from, from John Converse to John Zoller, yeah. you get this sense that public opinion is sort of this like, uh, it's, it's slippery and weak and it, yeah. you know, people come up with an idea off the top of their head sure. based on the last thing they heard. And, you know, in, in my classes now we're reading Tocqueville and one and Arendt and the other, and both of them would say, you know, there's a big difference between public opinion and then the habits of freedom and mm -hmm. in politics. And I'm just curious if studying public opinion in the Arab world has caused you to sort of, you know, does it give us an opportunity to sort of revise the way we can think about public opinion, which has been so based mm -hmm. here in America? And then in particular, I was curious about, 
you talked a lot about this idea of raising your head up and mm -hmm. dignity and the effect that has on public opinion on many issues in the Arab world. And if that, you know, it seems like there's a, there's, that's possibly this bridge between the sort of passive experience of having an opinion about things and the active experience of mm -hmm. sort of being willing to, right. to act on those things. Yeah, um, just two things. Uh, you know, I, I have um, John Zoller, was, by the way, of course, my contemporary at, at Berkeley, and his wife was uh, with me and uh, studying methodology at Berkeley with uh, with uh, Chris Aiken. We, I was doing quantitative at that time um, before I I shifted away from from that, and he was my contemporary at Princeton. Uh, we both taught at Princeton that first year. Of, who went out? Um, I uh, my early work actually on public opinion was. Um, uh, not in the Arab world, it was in the U.S. And um, my first article was with um, uh, a, a, a colleague by, by the name of John Krasnick, who's now a, a leading analyst at Stanford. Uh, what we did uh, was actually start with this, why, to, why public opinion doesn't matter, not why it matters. And uh, what we tried to do was, we, our argument was it matters, but in ways that you don't see. And, uh, and particularly the opinion of what we call the issue public, that segment of the public that ranks an issue high in its priority, is much more animated about that issue and therefore it's more relevant for policy making. And so much of what we did in our public opinion polling was to get at issue importance. So um, uh, therefore to get not just what people's opinion are on an issue, but how passionately they feel about an issue. And so a lot of my, um, the, the data in, in, in this uh, survey is actually modeled that way, which is we are asking questions about how people prioritize issues, how much, how passionate people feel about issues, because that's the part that is relevant for public policy. And I think in the end, that's, that's what really matters. So there's a lot of it in there pertaining uh, to passion. Now, remember what I said early on, even despite what I just said, that my interest in studying public opinion is not just to get at what people think today, but trying to understand what is it that is driving the public opinion. That gives you something about the passion. It gives you an indirect reference to their identity. And so that's how we, I do it. So I, I, I ask these indirect questions, not because I think the fact that they embrace Hugo Chavez means anything for Hugo Chavez. It doesn't, right? It's just telling you, okay, so what's the rule they're employing to select him? That's the rule that's more central for me, is understanding that rule. And I think that's why a public opinion is, is interesting. It's because it's more than just trying to get at what people think at any given time. I think Brian was trying to get at what are the methodological and, and also the, uh, the other issues that might be really associated with studying public opinion and what are the pitfalls when we go to them, uh, you know, um, uh, in doing these surveys, you know, um, are we aware of it? And it looks like you are, you know, you, you want to go beyond just the surveys and that's very, very important. Um, uh, let me see other questions or, yes, sir. Arab Israeli, Could you the Arab Israeli. What what is going to happen? You, I know you know the answer. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Um, well, I'm I'm certainly close to it, and and I'm talking to all all parties on that. And I'm doing polling. I just um, I just uh, in December I did two major polls: one among Israelis, one among Palestinians, uh, on their outlook on a two states. Now I could tell you that um, when you ask them whether they think American diplomacy will succeed, I had 4% of Israelis say yes and 11% of Palestinians. Um, when you ask them whether um, uh, they believe the two-state solution will ever happen, I have 50% say no. It'll never happen. When you ask them how many of you think it'll happen in the next five years, very few say it'll happen in the next five years. So pervasive pessimism. When you ask them whether they, uh, they're prepared to compromise on issue by issue, Jerusalem, borders, settlements, most of them don't want to compromise. So it sounds terrible, but then here's the interesting thing. Then I put a compromise solution together, uh, 
very much along the lines of what the State Department was thinking. And uh, I put it on the table. And I said, uh, here's what you negotiators got. Um, you know, that's all they can get. Take it or leave it. Uh, which, which one, uh, w what would you do? Would you advise them to take it or leave it? 54% uh, of Israelis said they'll take it. 41% um, of Palestinians say they'll take it. And then I do another trick, which is knowing that part of their reluctance is they don't think the other side will take it. They think they'll just pocket the concessions and go home. I said, well, assuming the other side also accepts it, would you then accept it? Then I get 60% of Israelis and 60% of Palestinians say yes. So they're prepared to, the public is ready for a compromise deal. Uh, you can't do it issue by issue because issues are traded. If they want to know if they're for compromising in Jerusalem, they're going to get something on refugees or vice versa. And so package, the public is there. If Palestinian and Israeli leaders want to make a deal, they can make a deal. They'll get the publics behind, in my opinion. They'll get it through. Now, do their leaders want to make a deal? Um, we had a, um, uh, if, if you uh, look at what John Kerry has been doing and what President Obama has been doing, uh, if you read what uh, President Obama said in his uh, interview last week uh, with uh, Jeffrey Goldberg, uh, the, the, the columnist, a very revealing interview, uh, what you will notice is that the administration is focused on Benjamin Netanyahu personally because they've reached the following conclusion, that uh, part of his government is incapable of making, does not want a deal, so forget them, it's not going to work. If he personally wants a deal, he can put a different coalition together, bring in people from the left to replace the right wing, and he can get it through the public. So he individually is actually the focus of American diplomacy. On the Palestinian side, they think the Palestinians want a deal. But the question is they're so weak that sometimes they squeeze them a little more than they realize. This is what happened in 2000 when they squeezed them too much on Jerusalem and Jerusalem brought down the whole deal. And I think there's a little misunderstanding about how the Palestinians, how much they can get away with if they, if, if, uh, if they make a compromise. But so I say that the chances of something that the U.S. would put on the table that would be a, um, accepted by both Israelis and Palestinians is, is a little higher than what people are assuming. I wouldn't say a majority. I wouldn't say over 50. The president put it at less than 50-50. It's definitely less than 50-50. It's not impossible. And part of the reason for it is the U.S. is determined. And it's determined for a lot of reasons. But one reason is that uh, I wrote about it over the weekend uh, in, in Foreign Policy magazine. I did another poll uh, here in the U.S. about what the American people think of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I say, what would happen if, let's assume that two state is no longer possible, what would you support? And I give them all the options that are still available. And you find that of those who supported the two-state solution, two-thirds say that they would then support one-state solution with full equality for Jews and Arabs, in which case Israel would cease to exist as a Jewish state. And that includes 52% of pro-Israel, people who, who said they want the U.S. to lean toward Israel, in large part because the two-state solution is the psychological solution for most people on supporting Israel on the one hand and some moral principle on the other. You take it away and you have, you're forced to make decisions you don't want to make. No American leader wants to be there. No American leader will, you know, if, they, if, if Obama were to admit that it's no longer possible to have two states, he wouldn't know what to advocate the next day. He can't advocate uh, occupation indefinitely. He can't politically advocate one state with equal citizenship. So, you know, it, it leads to paralysis, which is why I say in my article, in that case, if he were really to conclude that it's no longer possible to have two states, he will go the next morning and say, it's still possible to have two states, uh, because, the, because he doesn't want to be in that position. Um, 
I'm, I'm really tempted with this really last question, which you mentioned in your book, which is you distinguish between, uh, in your uh, surveys, about how people in these six countries that you, um, you analyze differentiate between um, values and policies, American values and American policies. And also, you, you began to, you know, you, you, began, you address the question that in America we have this perception that we are a, a good force up to abroad. We are a very, very, we have a very good uh, impact on, on the world at large. Would you comment briefly about these two? Um, um. Well, well, first of all, in terms of uh, values uh, versus policies, um, you know, we, we have uh, put a question that's directly related to that pertaining. There's a whole chapter on attitudes toward the United States. We've done a lot of research on attitudes toward the U.S. and asked one, one direct question, which is, is your anger with the U.S. mostly based on, A, its policies, or B, B on its values? And we have you know, almost 80% say it's policies, not values. But we tease that out. Uh, we tease that out. So we try to compare issues related to America and what, what they think America is trying to do. And then we tease out uh, what issues they like and don't like about America. So we have a lot of information. One set of information is when you ask them, for example, what do you think America is trying to do in the Middle East? And then I give them, uh, spread democracy, spread peace, bring about stability, uh, control oil, help Israel, weaken the Muslim world, um, uh, minimize weapons of uh, 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 proliferation weapons of mass destruction. Uh, we give them all these things to good and bad. To, to we know what goes on in the discourse to see how they rank them. Overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, uh, the number one and you know the, the top answers are. Uh, uh, control oil and support Israel, uh, weaken the Muslim world. Uh, those who think we're trying to spread democracy or trying to bring peace in the Middle East are less than 10 percent, uh, even when we were saying we were doing it. So there's mistrust of the intention. So it's not about, you know, they don't like democracy. They don't think that's what we're doing. And they don't think that's what we're bringing about. We don't, they don't like the outcome. So in Iraq, after the Iraq war, we kept asking, you think there's more democracy or less democracy in Iraq, the overwhelming majority in the Arab world says there's less democracy in Iraq. Now, you know, that's an interpretation, uh, but nonetheless, they, that's, so they're, they're, but when you ask them, name the two countries that have most freedom and democracy for their own people, um, all the countries that they name are Western countries, including the U.S. So they know that they're, you know, uh, uh, even Turkey, that they think is relatively more democratic, is not as democratic as the Western countries. They don't name Iran, they don't name Pakistan, they don't name Saudi Arabia. Uh, when you ask them, if you want your, uh, a member of your family to study abroad, where would you want them to study? Uh, all the countries they name are Western countries, including France, UK, the US. So, so they, they embrace, you know, they, that's, not, that's not the issue for them. Uh, the issue for them is principally foreign policy on big tickets and interpretation of American intentions. Well, I would like to thank all of you, and including the people from the community who joined us today. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us on this wonderful day. Uh, enjoy the spring uh, sunny day outside. And on behalf of all of you, uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Talhami for a wonderful uh, lecture and good discussion. Thank you very much.